didn't do. And uh, these things just become, come flooding back and you realize there's many things you left undone that should have been done and things that you did that you ought not to have done and the sense of regret is real, is real potent. You've not lived up to your commitments and you realize that you've not been faithful to him. Perhaps you <clears throat> disobeyed his word to you. Perhaps you denied him by the way you lived and your Christian life has gotten cool and the fire of commitment has died out and you've drifted back into activities that you had otherwise abandoned. The new year brings out in us a desire to make new resolutions, new commitments to ourselves and to the Lord. But with the old resolutions left unfinished or unopened, I want to ask you, is there a better way? Will making more new or newer commitments help or is something else needed? Turn with me in your Bibles to John 21. I'd like to use its text to help us during these moments. John 21. NIV would be a good version. I neglected to tell the uh, gentleman or the, the tech team in the back. But the passage starts this way. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter... Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. I love how Jesus did this. You know, he just pops up on you. Somehow he keeps his, his, him, him, himself his, hidden. In a sense, they can't tell it's him. And he, he just, he, he milks the moment. He finds out what they're thinking. And, you know, this is something of a similar moment. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Now, they may be thinking, this is someone just wanting these fishermen to give him some fish. At this point, it's just, you know, it's common. You're coming back in and... Someone hungry, they told their wife they could have some stew fish today and, uh, and they want some fish and these fishermen when they come in and so someone's on the beach calling out, do you have any fish? No, they answered. And he said to them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. That was a strange thing for someone to be telling fishermen. When they did this, they were unable to hold the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. By Jesus, that's, that's the Lord. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dropped. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. And as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garments around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that marvelous? The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ calling you to have breakfast with him. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And you know the rest of the tale. Three times he asked Simon, do you love me? Three times theologians tell us to come against the three denials. Three times. Here is Peter, the one who has made some such bombastic promises to God about his loyalty and determination to follow Jesus wherever he went, and now and who is now living with the acute awareness that he has failed 
the Lord. And here he is. And not once, not twice, three times he asks him, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Before many witnesses, Peter had denied the Lord not just once or twice, but three times. And though Peter has seen the risen Lord on two other occasions and knows of his great power, Peter does not feel worthy. He is lost, almost aimless in his spiritual life, one might conclude, so that it is no wonder that he's drifted back into the one thing that gave him satisfaction before. He's gone fishing. Is that where some of us are this morning or this afternoon? Spiritually adrift, aimless, drifting back into the things that used to give us satisfaction, disappointed in ourselves, unhappy in our relationship with the Lord? Writes one commentator, Jesus has a wonderful way of restoring us when we fail him. He does not humiliate us. He does not criticize us. He does not ask us to make a resolution to try harder. Rather, he takes us aside and asks us to reaffirm our love for him. Do you love me more than these things? As you begin this new year, let me go back. Peter miserably failed his Lord when he fled with the other disciples from the Garden of Gethsemane. Later, he publicly denied that he even knew Jesus. Peter must have wondered if he had been capable of being Jesus' disciple anymore when he was unfaithful to him in his most crucial hour. You've got to feel Peter's anguish and recognize in there your own anguish, your own sense of you failed the Lord, and are you, can you be useful again in his hands? So as you begin a new year, you may be painfully aware that you have failed your Lord in many ways as well. Perhaps you were not faithful. Perhaps you disobeyed his word that he gave you. You knew it was his word to you. That wasn't for so-and-so. That was his word to you, and you disobeyed it. Perhaps you denied him by the way you lived this year, last year. If you would just let him, Jesus, take you aside. If you will but acknowledge, yes, Lord, I love you, and let him take you aside as he did Peter. He will not berate you. He will not humiliate you. He will ask you to examine your love for him. He asked Peter, do you love me? And he's asking us, do we love him? If your answer like Peter's is yes, Lord, he will reaffirm his will for you, his will, his good, his pleasant, his pleasing and perfect will for you. If you truly love him, brothers and sisters, you will obey him. You will obey him. John 14, 15 makes it clear. Jesus does not need your resolutions, your recommitments, or your promises to try harder this year. If you resolve to obey God, if you resolve to obey God last year did not help you to be faithful, it will not make you successful this year. Jesus asks for your love, and with your love comes obedience to him. If you truly love him, your service to him in the new year will be of the quality that he desires. For Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. Abraham showed his love for God in an almost an unconscionable request, and he obeyed God. If we love the Lord, we will obey him. But brothers and sisters, what this requires is that we must make time to be alone with God and do it right away. Make time to be alone with God. Many times throughout the scriptures we see the saints of God are in a bad place. The one that gets me the most is Elijah. I, I, I'm, I'm very much, I see myself very much in the vein of Elijah. Preacher of righteousness, hates evil, but sometimes it's crushing. And if you don't go and recognize you've got to take time with the Lord and hear from the Lord and not be not and not make the mistake of thinking unless God answers in mighty ways it's not God remember now Elijah has gone into the cave and as he's waiting in the cave he hears a great earthquake and the scriptures say and the Lord was not in the earthquake and then there's this blazing fire scorching the the mountainside it says the Lord was not in the fire 
And there's this great wind just, just tearing stones off the mountainside as the Lord was not in the wind. And there was a gentle whisper saying, why are you here, Elijah? And Elijah got to learn that though he had been a mighty worker of God, seeing the great mighty works of God, he needed to understand each of us needs to know that God works in many different ways. And we need to know his still, quiet voice that is directing us, guarding us, guiding us, and keeping us. I know I hear the Lord there. <laughs> so the first thing that our text helps us with is we have to make time to come away with Jesus. Make time to come away with Jesus. Please, believer, please, 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 before the calendar gets loaded up, please... Please, set a course for the whole year. Make time to be with God. Make that time. You don't want to go into the, the, this new year aimless, drifting, still disgruntled with God, still not satisfied with your spiritual life. No, steal away. Steal away. Spend some time with God. Hear the Lord. Let the Lord restore you so that you can have a better year. Friends, I know the difference between having spent time with God the night before and drawing out the calendar for the next day to starting the day, having spoken with God, rushing into the day, and just find myself overwhelmed. I know the difference. Imagine that for a whole year. And so, brothers and sisters, take time. Steal away. Have some time with God. Is there a day or part of a day that you can set aside to be with God? If you're married, please tell your spouse you need to take the time off to hear from God. I mean, the relationship's going to be a whole lot better if that husband, that wife, who has been just difficult to live with, goes away, spends some time with God, and comes back a renewed man or a renewed woman. So, so spouse, if someone is saying they need time to hear from the Lord, don't fight that. Might get a better husband coming back, better wife coming back. Don't fight that. Let them have some time with the Lord. If you're single, you'll need to alert those around you to protect your time alone with God. Don't let anyone interrupt this time, but have the time alone with God. Then you want to ask persons to pray for you during your prayer retreat. Pray that you will break through and hear from the Lord. I've never made an important decision in my life without going on a prayer retreat. Never. Never made one. The decision to go to seminary did not make it on my own. I heard from the Lord. Time for you to go, Lyle. But Lord, I have no money. What is that to me, says the Lord? I will provide for you. Okay, God, they could think I'm stupid, but anyway, let's go. Had to make a decision. Um, some romantic prospects in my life went to the Lord, heard from the Lord. Very clearly, I came out of there knowing Janelle Louise Abrams. My mother-in-law is sitting here. I'm not sure if she's heard this story, but boy, I tell you, it could not have been any clearer. I said, Lord, that's not the one I was expecting you to say. But thanks be to God for 20 wonderful years with a woman of incomparable worth to me, the mother of my four children, and the woman who has made my life a dream come true. Thanks be to God. I heard him. I heard him. It was not culturally relevant, but it was God's will for me. And I'm grateful to God. I overcame all of my preconceived, don't do this, that's not the thing to do, what are people going to say? I overcame it, and I'm the beneficiary of obeying God's will. Time alone with God to hear his will for you is utterly important if you want to live in the center of his will and enjoy the blessings of a life of favor and blessing. You've got to hear from God, and you can't do it when you're hearing the noise of the world. You've got to steal away, and you've got to have that time, an open Bible, an open notebook, your hymn, your hymn book. These days, you've got an iPad, iPod. In my day, I had to get an old tape recorder. I bet you this, half the school don't know what a tape recorder is. <laughs> and Brother Charles Seal, if I showed them an A-truck, they would say, what is that? What did you do with that? Now you got your iPad, your iPod, your i whatever. I hear you got something else called an Android. Any of y'all see that? All right.
But you've got to take time to prepare for your retreat with God. And you want to bring all the things you'll hear from and prepare for that retreat. When I knew that I was going to meet with God, I, I told my friends, I need to hear from the Lord. I need a breakthrough. I need you praying. I'm going to be gone for this period of time. I need you praying during the time. Do I have your, your can I trust you to pray? Because I need a breakthrough. I need to hear from the Lord in this matter. And I had everything prepared, all the questions I had for the Lord. And the Lord would talk to me. The Lord would talk to me. And, and oftentimes, he wouldn't tell me what I wanted to hear. I mean, I could still remember the sense of rage that swelled up in me when he told me I was going to the ghetto of Chicago. You know my story. I was like, I told the Lord, hell no! 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 I'm not going to Chicago! No! How could you send me there? Real Jonah moment. And God says to me, so Lyle, having watched me provide for you for four and a half years, having watched me do for you what you could not do for yourself, having watched me train you to make you a qualified minister of the gospel, your, first, your very first response to me is no. Oh, brothers and sisters, for someone who loves the Lord, who wants to do right by the Lord all the time, that is a devastating blow. And it was more than I can bear. I fell to my knees in utter repentance. And I said, how could I? How could I say to such a gracious God, no. And I got up off of my knees, truly humbled and repentant, and I said, Lord, wherever you say to go, I will go. I have never, ever had more powerful ministry in my natural life than my year and a half in Chicago. Never. Because I was so utterly, utterly, utterly at the mercy and dependent on God because I was somewhere where I did not want to be. And God said, my son, as he said to Abraham, Abraham, because I see that you love me, I want you to know I'm going to bless you beyond you, your understanding. And, and, and your descendants will be blessed. It was, it, I can't compare to Abraham, but I understand the spirit of the same, the same kind of spirit was going on. And God blessed me. I wasn't rich. So now I had to go and I had to borrow money to take her out. I mean, I wasn't rich by any... I've made up for that a billion times over. But, you know, it, 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 I, was, I was living in poverty doing ministry in Chicago by the will of God. And brothers and sisters, I want you to have that same joy of knowing that you're living and you're in the center of God's will because you've said, you've said God, all that I am and all that I have, it's yours. Here I am, all of it, take it all. I can't make something of my life better than you can make of it. But brothers and sisters, we've got to steal away and have those moments with God and let God says, I, I want that. Take now your this, your favorite this, and give it to me. There's no true walk with God if there are still idols in our heart. There's no true going to the next level if we're still holding on to something. It can't get there. We've got to let it go. Let it go and trust this faithful God. Because the one thing you need to have going into a prayer time with God is this. Underline it, circle it, star it, whatever you got to do. An obedient heart that seeks to know his will. It is pointless, pointless to go into a retreat time with God without a heart that's obedient. You've got to be obedient. You've got to be obedient. It's got to be his will. And brothers and sisters, I know it's hard, but I'm telling you, I've done it. Numbers of you here have done it, and many times over, and your lives have been blessed. And others have been the beneficiary of those lives that have been blessed. Let's trust this God who is utterly faithful. I suspect that for some of us, um, we've lost respect for God. We've lost an appreciation for God. We, 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 we kind of have kind of brought him down to our level. And he's just, well, you know, someone you occasionally you can talk to. But brothers and sisters, I pray for us that we would have an Isaiah experience where God would show up, peel back the curtain of eternity, and let us see him in all of his holiness. 
Because there's only one thing that can happen when we see God. And we see who God really is. And Isaiah said it for all of us. Woe, it's me. Woe is me. For I have seen the Lord, and I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the glory of God. You can't have an exalted view of yourself when you have seen the Lord in all of his glory. You can't think that much of yourself when God allows you to see him. And you fall on your knees. And you say, oh Lord, for the privilege of being able to serve you, I submit all that I am to your will and to your glory. Isaiah thought he was undone until the Lord removed his sin. Asked who will go, and Isaiah said, I will. Brothers and sisters, when God shows us his glory, when God lets us see what we've done, what he has done to save us, there's only one response. What would you have me to do? Where would you have me to go? I'm yours. I would have each of us, brothers and sisters, to start this year off fully sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. God would have us, for he says, be holy even as I am holy. He's our example. Isaiah's encounter with a holy God made him immediately and keenly aware of his own unholiness and sinfulness of those around him. It is impossible to worship God and remain unchanged. The best indication that we have truly worshipped is a changed heart. A changed heart. A changed heart. Have we so conformed ourselves to a sinful world that we are satisfied with unholy living? Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, I almost died when I heard a man of God utter the utter foolishness that came over my TV on Friday. <laughs> Stunning. Stunning. That a man of God could be so deceived and intentionally divide the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ and intentionally bring repute on the leadership of his church. Stunning. Pray that he would see God in all of his holiness and the repentance would take place. Even as you pray for yourself and I would pray for, for myself and us that we would see God in all of his holiness, that we would abase ourselves of pride and thinking something of ourselves rather than everything of God. Don't compare yourself uh, to others. Recognize that each of us must see God for ourselves and repent. Ah, someone has said, unconditional obedience to God is the first evidence above all else that we desire intimate fellowship with God. Jesus says, you are my friend if you do whatever I command you. There's no getting away from the lordship of Jesus Christ. There's no getting away from discipleship and fellowship except absolute obedience to the Lord. We're in an age where the, the, the proclamation of God's word, we want to get a second opinion. Ah, that's what God's word said? Okay, now what do you think? We're not interested in God's word. We're interested in our, what we want to do, and if we could get God's blessing to cover what we want to do, it'll be just all right. But the prayer is not, Lord, bless what I'm doing, but Lord, let me be a part of what you're blessing. That is a prayer that must be spoken from our lips. How important is it for us that God's peace reign in our hearts for the scriptures say this, John 15, 9 through 12. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. God calls us to love each other. God calls us to be his hands, his feet, his arms. God calls us to 
minister to each other and to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. How important is it for us that God's peace reigns in our hearts at all times? Let me pull out an illustration of someone spending time with the Lord and receiving a word from the Lord. Now, let me, let me, say, let me say this at the beginning. I thought long and hard about whether to include this because I don't think this illustration is something that everybody can just start off with. This is a mature saint who has had a history of listening to God. I want to make sure I don't send anyone off on the deep end, so I say that at the beginning. But here's a story told from the book by guess or by God, and it speaks about guidance, how we can know God is guiding us. It says, one morning, while a 70-year-old woman in New Zealand was having her daily Bible reading, this was her daily Bible reading, she was used to the Lord speaking to her, she was arrested by a scripture that spoke about going to a mountain and waiting. This wasn't just a scripture. The scripture was taking on a new meaning, and she knew it. This was, this was not just casual reading. God is in some way magnifying this scripture to a hearing, to understanding. She seriously pondered the verse, but received no understanding, so went on reading. Immediately, she felt the departure of the peace of God. Because she knew the peace was a sign of God's Holy Spirit's presence, she went back and read the verse again. The peace instantly returned, assuring her that God had spoken. The lady asked God what he was trying to say. Which mountain? Immediately, the mountain of Te Aroha was impressed upon her spirit. This mountain was about 30 miles from her home. She walked to the nearest town and caught a bus. Uh, once again, did I mention this is a 70-year-old woman? She walked to the nearest town and caught a bus to the town of Te Aroha, often wondering if she was doing something foolish. Reminds me of when I declared to the church that I was going off to seminary and didn't have a dollar to show for it. But I knew very clearly God had spoken to me. That was beyond the doubt. When she lo looked up at the mountain, she said, What now, Lord? The answer came back, Start climbing. This obedient elderly woman slowly plodded up the mountain trail. About 30 minutes later, she came to a lookout spur. To her relief, she noticed a wooden seat. On it was seated a young man. As she approached him, she had a deep sense of the Lord's presence and an understanding that this was the purpose of her unusual mission. The young man looked to be in bad shape, so she came right to the point. Young man, God has sent me nearly 30 miles to talk to you. It must be important. What's the matter? After a brief, stunned silence, he burst into tears and told her, that he had climbed the mountain track to attempt suicide. He said he didn't have the courage to jump into a river and drown, and that every time he tried to tip his car over, he couldn't do it. He explained that in desperation, he'd come up to the mountain looking for someone, somewhere to jump off. But the wonderful news of God's redeeming love through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, and that he was the answer to every human need, the young man received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith as his personal Savior and committed his whole life to him. The young, man's view, the, the young man's new life in Christ started with assisting the lady down the mountain and driving her back to her home. Now, brothers and sisters, uh, I, I can't, I don't want to play Holy Spirit on anybody, but, but please, um, that's a life of faith that God has built into that woman. Um, that needs to be a, an, a, a practice and acquired skill of faith. Uh, please, I do not want anyone to think I am advocating that they can just up and do something like that, thinking they're hearing from the Lord, because the Bible says, test the spirits, for many spirits have gone out, and they're not all of the Lord. And so please, 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 I don't want anyone opening their Bible and say, Judas went out and hung himself, flip a few pages, look, as they go down and do likewise. Please, please, please. This is dangerous business. Um, but God does direct us through his scriptures, and many persons sitting here can give the the, a similar testimony of God's leadership in their life. Okay, but let's, let's bring things to a close. Um, again, because you have stuff in front of you, I'll just quickly touch on them. The degree of the fear of the Lord upon us will determine the degree of obedience to God in our lives. So cultivate 
The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the, beginning of wisdom. If you, in your heart and mind, God has begun to become somebody that you do, not, you do not fear, I would want to encourage you to cultivate a sense of awe and reverence for God. Um, only when we choose, moving along, only when we choose to be nothing can God be everything in, our, in any situation. Only when we truly fear God will we be released from the fear of people. Unconditional obedience to God for is the evidence of a holy life. We're only behaviorally holy in God's sight as we are obedient to his voice. Learn to hear his voice. Learn to obey his voice. A very healthy spiritual exercise is to frequently ask ourselves the following three questions. Am I doing what God has directed me to do? Is it in the timing that he has directed? Is it being done solely for God's glory or is there some hidden motivation for self-preservation? And five, unconditional obedience to God is a way of life, as a way of life, is evidence of our being true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me end with this. I, I have there a couple of, um, um, under the title, areas to check with God related to obedience. Because obedience is key. We saw it in the passage with Abraham. Obedience is key. If we are to move to the next level, and God would require of us something that we have as an idol. Remember, Jesus didn't tell everybody, sell what you have and go and give it to the poor. He told it to a rich man whose confidence was in his riches. He says, you, not, not Cyril, you, you go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me because that was that young man's idol. And so God comes to us and he says, give me your idols, give me your tin gods that I would have all of your heart so that you would serve me in great power. You see, friends, because what I didn't mention, I'll mention very quickly. Those, that year and a half in Chicago were powerful years where the, the anointing on my life I have never, ever had since then. The, 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 the power in prayer, the, 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 you don't even finish preaching and people are getting saved. It, it was just an incredible anointing. And it was based on obedience. And all I'm, I'm trying to do in, in the power that God is providing is helping us to understand we need to come to a place where we are bent before a holy God in utter obedience and saying, God, here is my life. Do with it as you will. It is yours to use as you please. I abase myself before you. I give you my heart, my soul, my mind, my life. It belongs to you. And just to close us, I have, I have for you a listing of things that might be hindering God's spirit at work in speaking to you. Look through the list carefully. There are things that might be quenching the spirit's work in your life. The attention you're paying to your family, for instance. Intercession for others. Do you care that others are dying and are hell-bound? Are you praying for people? Do you have a list of people that you're praying for that they might be saved? You see, just living for yourself quenches the Spirit of God because God would have us to live selflessly. Are you witnessing? Are you using your body right? Are you having regular exercise? What about your finances? Are you tithing, offerings, pledges, do you owe someone money and you've not given it to them? Deal with it. Deal with it, brothers and sisters. Some of you owe some people money and they have been waiting and you haven't returned it. Deal with it. Zechariah comes to faith. He says, Lord, if I owe anyone, I'll pay them up to fourfold. Zacchaeus, thank you. The little guy. Uh, is there some letters and phone calls you need to make, some communication that God would have you to be about that you've not been about? Is there correction that God has asked you to give to somebody and you've not done it? Is there forgiveness? Is there some gratitude that needs to be expressed that you've not been about? Is there some restitution, some, some humbling that needs to take place because you're just not where you ought to be with somebody? Are there some borrowed things that need to be returned? Is there a word that God has given you that you have not yet obeyed? Brothers and sisters, there's no advance until you deal with these issues. And so, as you would take time to go on that retreat, have your notepad and go through this. That's why I wanted to make sure you had it. I don't have to finish it because you can read for yourself. Go through that. Sp spend some time with the Lord. Lord, I want to meet with you on Saturday. 
And Lord, you know, here's a prayer I would pray that has helped me over the years. Lord, I'm not willing, but I'm willing to be made willing. Lord, I'm not willing, but I am willing to be made willing. You see, that's an honest, that's an honest rapport with a father who loves you. Lord, I'm not willing to do this thing. But God, because it's you and because I love you, I'm willing to be made willing. Lord, work my will over that I can serve you. So have that notepad. Write down the things you need to talk to God about. Be aware of those areas where the Spirit of God has seemingly almost stopped his work in your life because there's some unconfessed sin in your life. And take that time with God. With God. And make sure you've got your open Bible, some devotional music. And when God begins to speak to you, write them down. Make a commitment to follow it. Make a commitment to be led of God. Make a commitment to make a difference this year and beyond. God wants your whole life. Will you give it to him? As musicians start speaking, uh, us in our song time, take a few moments to reflect, and I'm going to pray for us that we make ourselves ready. Stand as we sing together. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree. to God today? I'm saying yes to you, Lord. Is that your answer to him? Some of you may have wondered, why did I have that emotional moment during the communion? Back in the hospital, John Hopkins. John Hopkins and I was taking my son with no guarantee I would ever see him again alive oh God oh God but God is a good God he's faithful and for going on eight years I've enjoyed my son and God has given me another son in the measure. Pray for Scotty. My desire is that Scotty would be much greater than I am. That Scotty would be a preacher of righteousness if it's God's will for him or a missionary or whatever or a school teacher, whatever. But there's Scotty and Lauren and Leah and Logan because of the example that Jadel and I have set, because of the faith that we express, because of grandparents that love the Lord, that they would use our example. They would surrender all and be all that God would have them to be. Never saying no to the Lord, but saying, yes, here's my life. 
I surrender it all. Perhaps some of you, because the Spirit has been moving today, some of you want to make it visible and clear to the Lord. You want to come out of your seat and say, yes, Lord. My answer to you is yes. I invite you to come to the front for prayer. Thank you. next to you who is making a decision to be sold out to God, who is giving their all to God, you want to feel that solidarity. Ah, sovereign Lord, we offer ourselves to you. We recognize, Lord, that our lives and our hands can do nothing, will amount to nothing. But your word is clear, if a seed should die and fall into the ground, it can produce much fruit. Lord, help these dear souls, help all of us to die to self, to die to self-will, to die to what I want, to die to a passion that is not of you. Lord, not our wills, but thy will be done. Oh Lord, give us a greater measure of yourself. Show us your holiness. Show us your glory. Show us your beauty that we would want none of what this world has to offer and all that you are. Lord, strip us of pride and self-will. Strip us uh, of uh, anything of the world's attachment that keeps us from giving ourselves wholly unto you. Lord, may your spirit fall on us now. May your spirit own our hearts and our minds, own our lives, own our wills, own our future, own it all. May you be glorified through these lives. We say yes, Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Our answer is yes. Do with us as you will. Own us for your glory, we pray, as we surrender ourselves to you. For Jesus' sake and in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Greet the person next to you. Say, may the Lord sustain you in your commitment to him. Those of you who have come forward today, I want to invite you sometime during the week to give me or one of the leadership a call and uh, let's help to process the decision that you've made today. Thank you. We want to invite our guests to join us for moments of light refreshments. We have. We have refreshments prepared for you behind, behind me in the Herbert El Trico Fellowship Hall. We'd like to be able to share a few light refreshments with you. Thank you.